I wanted to introduce to you to a topic that needs to challenge your heart, needs to challenge your, your spirit. It, when we actually begin to worship and we open our hearts in prayer or in song, something happens inside of us. God breathes into us His Spirit, almost like shining a light in a dark place. And He highlights what we need to work on next. Okay? So when I come to you in the, in the sermon time, the message time of the worship service, I'm asking you to open your heart and say, Lord, you show me what I need to know. All right? You take that very high intensity light that you've got and you shine it down into my spirit and you show me what I'm working on and what I need to surrender to you. All right? Because everybody has built their life on some sort of foundation stone. Everybody has a way of, of thinking about their lives that is based on some sort of a basic assumption about life and what we need to work on. All right? Sometimes we call those things our dreams, our aspirations, our desires. Sometimes we call them our passions. I have one pastor friend of mine who will remain nameless, who was passionate about the Cubs. <laughs> this year was a very good year for him. <laughs> but when you mention what things are happening in his life, he never talks about what God's doing. He's always talking about how the Cubs are doing. Okay? Usually it's not that good. But, what we are passionate about is a lot of times what we have built our life on. Our life goals. And sometimes we can even call them our obsessions. Are we building on the right foundation stones? Are we asking the right questions about what our lives really are supposed to be accomplishing? Now I want to turn with you to the heart of David. All right? David is one of those people in the Old Testament story of Israel that is like a pillar that stands up higher than all the rest. There are several pillars as you look down through there. If you look at Abraham, he stands as a pillar of faith. He's a, he's a marker of someone who just lived his life in harmony with God's will. Was he perfect? No. But he lived his life in obedience to what God wanted him to do. He was a pillar of faith. And then you come on down and you see people who followed him. Israel, Jacob, another pillar of faith. And Joseph, who saved his people from the famine by getting them to Egypt and being prepared for the famine. We feel... People like Moses, who stand as a pillar, a great pillar of faith, a marker. We see prophets like Elijah, pillars of faith. Now, <laughs> I need to tell you the fact. A pillar doesn't stay up where you can see it if it isn't sitting on the right foundation. All right? I was uh, reminded of worth working with my children back in their uh, growing up years, and we would use building blocks of all kinds of different varieties. And I always told them the same thing, you have to start with a good, strong foundation. If you don't have a foundation that's stable, you won't get the tower very high before it'll fall over. Oh, we've tried that too. Well. Dad, I don't think that foundation is that important. Besides, I want to use the rest of these blocks to make the tower real tall. Okay, see what happens. And they get it just a little ways up and then it tumbles over because it doesn't have a good foundation. If you want to be a pillar of faith, 
if you want to have something that actually lasts from what you've done to invest your life, you need to build on the right foundation. And these people who become pillars of faith, including David, had a lot of things that they could have used as a foundation for their lives. I want to read for you from the 139th Psalm, which David wrote during his life. And I'm going to read the first 12 verses and the last two. All right? O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You have me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will be not dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is light to you. Verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense, any offensive way in me that will lead me in the way everlasting. What were his foundation stones? He had, he had a lot of temptations for other foundation stones. I'll just run through a couple with you if I can. Decisions that aren't that much different from our own because we have lives that we've made decisions. We continue to make decisions based on what we vision ourselves to be doing, what we're supposed to be accomplishing. David was an artist, a musical artist. I know a couple of people who are artists who have just gone crazy with that artistic identity. You know what that means? They sacrifice anything for their art. And sometimes that's a very significant sacrifice. David was an artist. He was so good, so young. He was so gifted that he could come, he was asked to come into the palace and comfort King Saul in his uh, declining years and keep him from going crazy just with his music. He was a gifted musical artist. He wrote many of the psalms as his own verbalized prayers. He was an artist. But did that define him? Is that what he spent his life doing? Was that one of his foundation stones. No, not really. It was one of the things he did well. But it didn't become his complete identity. As good as he was at it. He was a warrior. David was a warrior. He had a warrior's heart. <laughs> I, I think what it must have felt like to be a the youngest son of Jesse's family and to walk into that camp where Goliath was challenging the armies of Israel every day. And he put his hands on his hips and said, why are you people putting up with this? Can you imagine a kid? A kid? 
standing there looking at his older brothers, who were really the ones who were supposed to be the soldiers. This is stupid. Why doesn't somebody take him on? You back and read the story. That's what he did. I'll do it. He had the heart of a warrior. He didn't look at things like normal people do to say, what's the danger? Let me see what the payoff is. Do I face the giant? Or, um, he, he could kill me. He could take me apart and feed my little pieces to the birds. He could, you know, uh, throw me to the wild animals. He, he, he didn't weigh the dangers like most of us might. He had the passion to see something major happen. He was a visionary. He could see what God could do. At the heart of a warrior. And yet, as strange as it seems, he could actually go and live in the Philistine villages and work for them as their own soldier protector. Even when Saul was trying to chase him down, he was under the protection of the Philistines and he worked as sort of a mercenary for them. He was a strange person, so complex, so incredibly complicated in how he was put together. Was he a warrior? Yes. But he also had other things that he wanted to do. It didn't become his identity. He was a general. You know what a general does? A general rallies the troops and puts the strategy together to get the job done. Not just a, an individual soldier like he might have been at Goliath. But almost the very first thing you read about David is he gathered around himself a group that he called his 30 mighty men. I, I tried to do that in Bradenton one time. I started a Bible study group. I was going to ask the men of the congregation to become my 30 mighty men. They said, there's only four of us. <laughs> we have to start somewhere. You know, he knew how to motivate and bring in people who had the right gifts and the right abilities. He knew how to use people strategically to get the thing done. He had great power to be able to have 400 men. 400 men under the work of David was an amazing army. And it was only 400. Read the stories of what his military conquests were. It was incredible. He was a great general. But that wasn't all that he was either. He was a great builder. He chose Jerusalem as his capital. And that was a little bit of a problem because Jerusalem didn't belong to the Israelites. It had never been cap uh, captured from the enemy when they had taken the Holy Land, the Promised Land. And it was still an enemy territory when David was just coming in as king. Well, that didn't seem to be too much of a problem for a fellow like David. He figured out what the biggest weakness was and snuck in through the side of the mountain underneath the wall, climbed up through the water channel that the city had used to try and keep fresh water coming into the city, and took the city by storm without firing a shot. And then that's where he built his palace. That's where he built his home. He, he became the master builder of Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. He loved to build. I, I think he would have built the temple if he had been given a chance. But God said, that's going to be for somebody else. So all he did was just clear off the land and bring in all the supplies, all the equipment, everything needed to build the temple was all sitting there ready to start as soon as Solomon began his reign. He was a builder, a contractor, a craftsman. He was a king. He'd been anointed king even as a small child, young man. And yet it didn't become his identity. What does it mean that it didn't become his identity? Well, he was still just a boy. He still was in the palace playing music for the king, but never assumed, because he had been anointed, that he was the king. In fact, Saul stayed the king and 
David stayed faithful to him as a subject of the king all the way through until his death and was grieved when his king died, even though it meant that he was going to become the next king. He grieved over the death of the Saul that hated him. He had the opportunity to kill Saul and become king on a couple different occasions, refused to do it. He didn't see being a king as his only identity. Or he would have grabbed it right then. He was king because God gave it to him. He was an artist because God gave it to him. He was a warrior because God gave it to him. He was a general because that's what God gave it to him. He was a father. Sometimes we might say he wasn't a very good father. You know, had problems in their family. Anyone that doesn't have problems in their family, raise your hand and we will make you the judge of whether or not he did it right. <laughs> no. We don't control our kids, and David couldn't control Absalom. But did it stop him from loving his son? Even though his son was rebelling, even though his son was trying to take over the throne by force, even though Absalom drove David, his own father, out of the capital city and made him run for his life? What was David's words to his generals and his army? Whatever you do, don't harm Absalom. I love him too much. He was a father. When his son with Bathsheba was so desperately ill, he revealed his father's heart. He revealed his passion for his children. Weeping and gnashing his teeth and pouring ashes upon his forehead, being dressed in a sackcloth, grieving as he prayed out to God, please, please spare my son's life. He was so deeply grieved with his father's heart that his Helpers in the palace were afraid to tell him when the infant had died for fear he might harm himself. What they didn't realize was he loved that baby because it was what God had given him. And as soon as that child had died, had passed away, he got up, cleansed himself, washed his face, put on clean clothes, and asked for lunch. And they were a marvel at that. What in the world? How can you grieve so passionately, so emotionally drained? And then, seems like it didn't grieve at all. He said, no. But as long as the child was alive, I could pour out my desire to the Lord to help and protect him. But once he's gone, the only thing left is to go and be where he is. That's the only answer. Now I'll go and I will be with him. He loved it because that's what God had given him. And I'm sorry to report, in case you haven't read the story, David was also a sinner. How can you be a sinner and be a pillar of faith? I call him a pillar of faith. How can you be a sinner, an adulterer, a liar, a murderer, and still be a pillar of faith? Doesn't that pretty well exclude you from that group? Yes, he sinned. Yes, it was bad. But as soon as the prophet of God pointed his finger at him and said, you're the man, you're the one, you are known by God to have sinned. It's not hidden. It's not secret. God knows. Now you know. David's heart was broken and he ran into the temple and grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar to ask God's forgiveness for his sin. 
My friends, I want you to understand. Of all the things that could have been the foundation stones under King David, all the popularity, all the power, all the wealth, all the perks that go along with being in high office did not mean that was what he built his life on. He was so much encouraged and, and excited about the tabernacle finally being brought to Jerusalem that he danced and performed a celebration in the streets of Jerusalem as the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant was brought to set up on top of Mount Zion. Well, you would say, that doesn't look very kingly to me. His wife even mentioned to him. <laughs> Criticized him for him. You made a fool of yourself, David. Oh, man, he said, it was so good to have the presence of God now right here among us. I couldn't do anything else but celebrate. But they didn't mean he didn't take his responsibilities as generals lightly. He took everything as though it came directly out of the hand of God. And he had to handle it based on the fact that he was known by God. Here's the thing. We cannot live our life without making assumptions about what's important. Some of us look at our life and say, I'm going to choose to make a living. I'm going to, I'm going to create a way to make an income, and I'm going to make a living for my family. I'm going to protect them uh, from financial hardship. I'm going to make a living. I'm going to have a career, and that's what I'm going to do. And when it comes time for the obituary to be written, They'll put one line. <laughs> I'm sorry, it only comes down to about one line. I've read thousands of obituaries. He was a good, then he fills in the blank, craftsman or a good carpenter or a good plumber or a good mason or a good preacher. You only get one line in the obituary. If that's what you want to invest your life in, be very conscious of the fact that it won't amount to very much. It's just one sentence in a bit. If you invest yourself in power or authority or something else that makes sense to you, this is what I really feel strongly about. Sometimes it can mean that it just washes away. Uh, I've seen people, very good friends, who decided they were going to make money and just wealth was their reason for moving forward. And at one point, they got everything they ever prayed for. I will share this with you just as a, one single story. He got a check for $300,000. Now, wouldn't you be thrilled if, if getting money was your main goal? Wouldn't you say, cool, I did it, I accomplished it, it was so wonderful. The problem was that had become his foundation stone. And within about six to nine months, it was almost all gone. It evaporated as fast as it appeared. And after he had recovered some of his uh, uh, trauma at that, and he came back to the Lord, you know what his pastor asked him to do? I was not his pastor. Uh, uh, I was his very good friend. But the church that he was attending, when he came back to the Lord, the pastor would have him come up here for that moment just before the offering. And he would say, my friend, would you please explain to these people the importance of wealth? <laughs> and he would give little sermonettes on how to keep your life from being completely absorbed by just grabbing a bunch of money. He'd learned that building a life just by building up a big pool of wealth is an unstable foundation. The only foundation that makes sense is the foundation of faith. 
And if you look at Psalm 139 and verses 23 and 24, I want you to just focus in on those two verses if you can for just a moment with me. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and know what foundation stones I'm placing it on. Search me, O God, and search my life to see just what I'm holding as the most important thing about life. And know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The words of David are a way of x-raying down inside of his own heart. I only want to live in a way that pleases my Father in Heaven. There's only one thing about my life I want to be responsible to do. The only way I want to be known for, not as the King of Israel, not as a father who had great passion for his children, not as a general with great strategic possibilities and wonderful creative ways of fighting battles, not as one who rallies the troops and keeps People so tremendously loyal to him. I mean, they loved him. Not as a politician who could make a new capital for a city. Not to build a nation from scratch. Not as a builder who could create wonderful buildings and bring together the elements for the temple. Not as just a fearless, fearless warrior. But a man after God's own heart. A man who loved his Father in heaven, his Lord, with a passion. Not even as a sinner. Sometimes when we fail, we feel like that's the only way we're ever going to be known as a moral failure. <laughs> as a failure to our family, a failure to our loved ones, failure to our community, a failure in life. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. David failed. But God didn't make that his identity. The reason he stands as a pillar is because he was standing on the foundation of faith and trust and hope in the Father in heaven who loved him, who was the father of all of his ancestors, Abraham and Jacob, Joseph, all of the people who helped bring the people out of bondage, Joshua, Moses, he was a man who wanted to be faithful to his God. Now I ask you carefully, not that I'm pointing the fingers at anybody, but listen to the Spirit of God. Is there something that has been out of balance in the way that you've been living? If there's something that's not been quite founded on those foundation stones, if there's something that you've put weight or importance to that doesn't really measure up, if you're a a fan of the Cubs. Think again. There are more important things than that. Even if you're a fan of the Falcons. I mean, I feel sorry for you, but there's things more important than that. I was going to say the Patriots, but they're already favorite Falcons. No, there are things more important than these things that pass away. Next year this time, there's going to be another discussion and two more teams in the, in the playoffs and nobody's going to remember this year. The important things last. Listen to your heart. Listen to what Jesus Christ is sharing with you in your heart. 